very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, here in ADEX, as well as that of you online on Zoom. Thank you very much for joining us today. It is our great honor to beam through Malaysia. Um, ADEX, we're actually in four locations, Singapore, Malaysia, Penang, and of course, SAP somewhere in KL. If uh, give a shout out from Kelvin, if uh, that's possible, he'll wave at him uh, this time round. Okay, so without further ado, we'd like to, of course, introduce to you Industrial Transformation Asia Pacific. It is a show that we've been doing in Singapore for the last two years. It is also a hybrid show of Hanover Messer that has been around for the last 70 over years. Hanover Mesa is something that we always say is the playground for technology, innovation, design thinking. What kind of out of this world technology that you could find, you always find it at um, Hanover Mesa. And now we are here in Singapore, as well as in Malaysia, to be able to say, we are bringing you design thinking. We are bringing you innovation. And through that, we're hoping with MDEC, Human Equation, Langit Collective, also with Tongguan, who's beaming in from Penang, also with BB Foundation, and of course SAP, and Duo Sparks over at the other corner, that we would be able to have a very riveting conversation today. But we first have our keynote. He is none other than Dato Wira Dr. Haji Rais Hussein Muhammad Arif. He is the chairman of MDEC, and he has many accolades behind him. I'm sure you must be wondering what else. He is a co-writer for a book, um, what do you call it, I, for, uh, for IR. I have read through it, and it's actually very, very thought-provoking. He's got a lot of quotes in there. In fact, when I was doing his talking points, I even referred to his book. <laughs> And he's, of course, an avid strategist, a perennial wordsmith, a social engineer, and by no means, uh, what do you call it, the president and CEO of Amir Research. But without further ado, I now pass on the mic to him. Thank you so much. And uh, good that I cannot blush. Uh, otherwise, I'll start blushing uh, with what she has just said. I think it's uh, uh, important that we understand the digitization of SMEs and society 5.0 in a wholesome way. Uh, we know that uh, SMEs uh, contribute, at least in the Malaysian context, uh, in excess of 30% to the GDP, uh, hiring 7.7 .7 million uh, people. It's a very important, uh, what we call, uh, sector and segment. Having said that, uh, we also been faced with what we call this COVID-19. Man, these guys are very stubborn. They do not want to leave us. I think they love us too much. Sometimes we make them love us by not adhering to what we're supposed to be doing. We saw what happened in uh, Sabah, and suddenly there is a second wave in uh, Peninsula. So, so that pandemic thing has actually accelerated. Uh, the digitization process. Uh, when the MCO uh, came about in Malaysia, we all know suddenly new norm has uh, become the real norm of what, how we are going to be. I mean, when I watch a Liverpool match, do you know anyone knows Liverpool? Okay, great. Uh, there are some booze too. But anyway, at this point of time, as the best team in the world, the Gegen Press, you know what's Gegen Press? In German, it's called high intensity. They play superb football, and the other day, we neutralized Arsenal without any problems. Diego Jota, a new player, almost got a hat trick for 10 minutes' appearance in that game. That's with Arsenal. Eh? I'm not talking about Brighton playing also Rennes, Man United. Eh? So you must understand the difference. However, the new norm resulted in nobody in the cop stand uh, actually celebrating that particular good win. And for Diego Jota, the only one thing he said after he scored his debut goal within 10 minutes of his presence, how I wish that the cop stand would have enough crowd to cheer me on. This is, a, this is a new norm. 
So when I talk about Liverpool, do not think that I'm, uh, I, I'm a great fan of Liverpool. I'm the greatest fan of Liverpool. So you must understand that. Huh? But what has that relevance to our SMEs today? Right? I, when, I like to give examples most of the time. Uh, I can talk about theories. I think the team, Fong and uh, uh, our friend there has written wonderful uh, speech. Uh, I like to speak off the cuff normally. Because when I speak off the cuff, it comes from quadruple bypassed heart. Actually, I went through a quadruple bypass. So I need to, it comes from my heart. We all know if we do not accelerate digitization, we are going to have a problem in Malaysia, right? Back in October, when the book that I co-authored was launched in the International Book Fair Frankfurt, we already uh, said many things that is going to happen. Some of it has already happened. Some of it, of it has gone to a, such an acceleration that that book almost needs another book very soon. By the way, we are writing the fifth one. So what I'm trying to say that things are changing so rapidly. Are we there to change? Are we ready to accommodate those changes? 600 to 800 million jobs are going to be obsolete according to the McKinsey report. Do you know a bank called Deutsche Bank? Deutsche Bank propelled the German economy for decades. All agree? Yeah, because that's a fact, right? Today, they are struggling to stay in business and survive. Why? Because the digital banks have overtaken, the neo banks, NEO, neo banks, have overtaken and they're doing great. And they are going to be the replacement candidate to, to the traditional way of doing things. Likewise, all the SMEs, when I speak, uh, spoke to some of the people I engaged with. Uh, I think my MDEC team will know I engage with everyone. And when I speak to them, some of them, they're not ready. Some of them, they're fearful. They say, oh, it's very structured. Uh, I need to add a lot of money. There's one company without naming the company. I met them because coincidentally, I was wanting, uh, I was in the market to buy something and the company offered. So I went to get them. They've closed down all their retail outlets. And they are now almost all on digital. So I went, finally I found the uh, that uh, entity is somewhere tucked in a place called Clown. And I went there and bought the stuff and coincidentally the CEO was there. And I said, boss, why do you close all the retail? So he said during the MCO, while the retail was nose diving and gone under, the digital space went up tremendously and therefore they decided i'm not going to be on the, uh, on uh, retail anymore it's a fixed study uh, see things are changing landscapes are changing are we ready for change are we ready for change now we have no choice we must change right so this man in his mind by the way his turnover is about 300 million ringgit huh? it's not a small company in his mind being digital means being in lazada you see? Simplistic. So I said, come, let me talk to you about a digitization. So I flipped open my mobile phone and I, I did spoke about MDEC and our friends seem not to be able to uh, comprehend uh, what MDEC stands for. Is it a deck of something? Is it no, no. Then I opened something and I showed, this is MDEC. Hey, that's you. So yeah, yeah, I'm working there. Right? I'm working there. And this is what we do. Why don't you come? Let's discuss. Hey, by a lot of investment. Investment ma, you know, typical China man, right? I, uh, investment ma. I said, don't worry. Whatever you are paying this Lazada and uh, what, what the others, what you're going to do, spending little money here is, is peanuts. But you will have an overall digital strategy. But how are we going to make it happen? Sometimes telling a real story is better than being theoretical. You know? So how to make it happen? So this, uh, I, I hope this particular uh, conference and uh, sessions will actually crystallize how do we deliver for the many. If we, can't, if we keep on starting and talking about for the few, we're not going anywhere. 
in the Malaysian context, this is an, a very important initiative to the extent the Prime Minister himself is chairing the 4IR Council. Uh, this is important, right? Usually in countries, uh, there will be one minister, this, that. because here in Malaysia, all the four or five ministers want to champion this because 4IR now is sexy. Whenever something is like Brook Shields, sorry, I'm in the old past, Brook Shield, sexy, oh, you know? But the problem is, sexy is good. Political narratives are good. Being popular is good. How would it impact the many? We have unofficially 1.2 million MSMEs. Officially about 800,000. But unofficially one... How do we reach them? Have we done enough outreach? Okay, talk about digitization, Amazon, this, that, in the cloud. So how many of us come down from the cloud, go to the Machi Salma in Panko, for instance, and help her to come out the vicious cycle of poverty? So these are the things that we need to think. We need to have empathy. And uh, my, oh, I'm very thankful that I've been invited for this particular session. Sorry, I didn't read the text. The text is very beautiful. I hope you make photocopy and share. But what I wanted to share with you is, as I said, from my very strong quadruple bypass heart, that we need to do something for the people while we are in, on this earth. Why? Because I've been to the other side. You know, in the, in the operation theater, there's something called Mr. Flatline? You know what's the Mr. Flatline? Do you know? What's the Mr. Flatline? Yeah. I went through that. I was dead for two and a half minutes. And I was defibrillated and revived. So now, my only mission in life is simple. How can we facilitate, accommodate the many? Remember, the SMEs are so critical, important, as an engine of growth for any countries, particularly Malaysia. You saw the statistics? GDP contribution, more than 30%, 7.7 million. And these days, I was talking to our friend here, just now, he was talking about, hey, what are we going to do about the potential retrenchments? It is going to happen if somebody comes and tell you all the goody goody, you know, nice, and you know, that's not it. It's going to, be, it's going to happen. Are we prepared? So these are the questions that I hope these sessions and will address for the betterment of, of all, of the many, not for the betterment of the few. Yeah? All right. Thank you so much for listening to me. If there's anything else, I'll leave it back to the chair lady here. Thank you very much, Dr. Vera. May I pose a question? Sure, sure. Can we welcome you to ITAP Connect in Singapore? Uh, uh, my boss is there, Yasmin, <laughs> so uh, he takes care of my time. Yes, why not? If I'm available, I will always speak uh, so long it, uh, it, it, it will bring some impact. If one person goes back today from this session thinking that I want to do something that is going to impact upon the many, I've considered that I'm very, very successful. Thank you very much, Datu Wira. Now, as we move on to the next session, it is the very interesting panel that we've put together coming from all walks of life, from an MNC to an uh, SME to a social enterprise. Um, and also, of course, including that of, uh, what do you call it? Da -da -da, and a big LLE, okay, which is David Ang. Um, but before I go on, I would like to introduce the moderator, Mr. Sharizal Sharani. He is from the BB Foundation. And uh, Sharani, and uh, what do you call it? He comes with a very in-depth experience. He's a serial entrepreneur. He's also a co-founder of BB Foundation. He has done a lot together with the US um, government, along with Mari, and we've had discussions along the lines of how can we bridge the gap between society and also, of course, with uh, politicians. We brought about topics and so on and so forth, but I do believe with his experience, it would definitely be something 
that could stir the panel session into a very creative one. Now I welcome Sharizal up onto the stage as he comes and then does the next session. I envision a future where agriculture will no longer be an industry that causes land degradation and climate change, but as an industry that contributes in regenerating on land and soil. We acknowledge rural smallholder farmers are key to food security and therefore by providing customized solution and creating fair price market access is our way to incentivize our rural communities to continue to farm sustainably. We are different because we strongly believe in integrating indigenous wisdom and appropriate technology when it comes to creating a powerful tool to achieve agricultural sustainability. Hi, my name is David Ang. I work for Tonggo Industries and part of Tonggo Industries, we have Newton R&D Center. We focus a lot on uh, sustainability, meaning that uh, we focus a lot on uh, creating green products, recycled products, uh, bio-based products. We focus a lot on innovation as well. So we use technology and uh, different testing methods to reduce damages on the road, accidents on the road. And we focus a lot on collaboration, meaning that we work with different stakeholders to make things happen. So basically we create value um, along the supply chain of uh, plastic manufacturing, of uh, transportation and logistics, and basically saving life by re reducing accidents on the road. Hi, my vision of the future is one similar to I guess what the cartoon series that Jetson portrays, one in which current and emerging technologies enhance our life and our lifestyle, enhance education, work, manufacturing, health and medical, leisure, and all the other aspects of our life. What I see is also heavily influenced by what one philosopher said, that if we do not catch up or if we do not participate in Industry 4.0 now, what will happen is we will become digital colonies of those who do. Because they will own all the intellectual property and we will, will be consumers of that intellectual property. And that drives what I do because I believe that it is essential that we prepare the current and younger generations for what is coming around the corner, how we can be not only consumers, but also producers of such technologies. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being with us in this challenging time. First of all, I hope that you, your family and friends are all well and healthy. I'm Kelvin, I'm the industry business architect from SAP Southeast Asia. SAP's vision is to help the world run better and improve people's lives. With over 47 years of experience and expertise in 25 industries, our global reach enables organizations to achieve meaningful business outcome and transform business into intelligent enterprise. We are committed to help every customer to become a best-run business especially during this unprecedented time. Being best runs means making a difference, especially on the area of digitalization and automation on the entire value chain in order to optimize both top line and bottom line, as well as to increase agility and resiliency of your supply chain in this period of Well, with that, thank you very much for the introduction. I will just have a short summary of who our panelists are today. We have Lillian from the Langit Collective. She's the CEO. Meng from uh, uh, Duo Sparks, also on, uh, online from uh, Penang and also KL. We have Kelvin from SAP and David Ang from Tongguan. Please well, give them a, a welcoming round of applause. So to kick off straight into our panel session, I, I have several questions. Uh, I'm going to ask each of our panelists a question. 
And if we have time, I hope we can have a very interactive and hopefully exciting um, conversation. So the first question I'd like to um, address is to Kelvin. So Kelvin, um, I know that um, SAP plays a very important role as an industrial ERP solution um, to streamline operations, uh, to make processes more efficient. Um, my question to you is how can manufacturers and especially um, SMEs uh, prepare themselves, get themselves data ready in order so that uh, they get themselves on board this um, new technology and, and create efficiencies. What are the new jobs can these solutions then offer to manufacturers and also for those prospective um, uh, uh, job seekers to, to actually um, reskill themselves? And, uh, and you know, on the downside, what are the jobs that the, these, these technologies are going to um, this place. Over to you. All right. Um, am I audible, um, Shariza? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank, thanks for the question. Yeah. I think. Um, I think digitalization has been become more important, especially during uh, this unprecedented time. Um, obviously, I think digitalization is not a tr new trend. Um, before, right? I mean, we talk about you know beyond b before six months before COVID, you know, and each and every one here. Uh, has already experienced lockdown and partial lockdown in the last six months. So digitalization has been a trend uh, at least a year ago, you know, for example. So, but digitalization has become more important, uh, especially for enterprise as well as SMEs in order to make sure that, you know, uh, business operations uh, runs smoothly, you know, and and, and efficiently, right, mainly. So that's where uh, we, what we observe is that, um, that digitalization through this particular time actually enables, you know, um, collaborative working environment. Uh, number one, coming from internal, basically internal collaboration of work, uh, as well as external collaboration. For example, with your business partner, your supplier, your logistic, um, your your logistic uh, business partner as well. In in making sure that that supply that comes in and as well as delivery will still be able to reach out to your end customer. Yeah, so I would say that um, based on my observation, speaking to customers around Southeast Asia through the last six months, um, obviously uh, I think um, workforce is having a sufficient workforce in certain business is a challenge. That's where automation has become a need, you know, um, in the in the enterprise as well as SME business. Yeah, so I would say that uh, number one, um, that's where. I would say automation and digitalization uh, has impacted each and every one of us um, at least the last six months. Uh, I think just to touch on, for example, you know, uh, when our keynote speaker mentioned about digitalization, meaning that people go and shop in Lazada and Shopee, I believe each and every one of us here has also done that once or twice at least in the last six months. In terms of what are the new jobs that are being created, right? So obviously automations are making sure that you know, uh, people are not doing redundant job um, uh, during this time, right? So one of the example that I want to pick on was that you know, when we speak to one of our wholesale distributor in the Philippines, in the past, a lot of um, sales order are reaching them via emails. Then they reach out to SAP and we did you know, a robotic process automation on the business processes that actually cut down about 20 to 30 hit counts. In, in processing those orders. But in reality that we do not really replace those people, but they are being reskilled, for example, to do much more value added job. So some of the value added job that we observe in the market, at least from information technology practitioner is that uh, people are exploring into, for example, data science, you know, and potentially much more analytical job um, in the market that's being made available. That's where people are being reskilled in, in a way, yeah. Thanks so much, um, Kelvin. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I was uh, very intrigued to one of the points that, that, that the, you know, I was saying just now about how companies today should look at technologies and even business models to serve the many. Mm -hmm. And we're very fortunate today to have a social enterprise with us, um, the Langit Collective. Um, I'd like to welcome um, Lillian. So what's interesting about Langit Collective is how they work with rice farmers in Sarawak. 
mm-hmm. and how they they try to help them connect to the marketplace. So the question that I want to sort of pick your brain a bit, Lillian, um, what are the top three challenges that, that you face in trying to connect these farmers to the marketplace? And, and how is the Langit Collective um, addressing the challenges to achieve a premium for their products and also a, a sustainable commercial um, ecosystem? Thank you for having me today. Um, well, just to take a step back, uh, we actually work in the settings in the rural area where accessibility is an issue. The only way to get in is a four-wheel drive on a logging road. Uh, where there's internet connection is very temperamental. Sometimes you have it, sometimes you don't. Um, the main problem is, uh, I guess, when we first started Langit, uh, it was very unprecedented in that area. No one has done it before. Uh, so supply chain was an issue. Where we have to build the entire supply chain on our own. And uh, very quickly, we find that our ideas are very naive because there's a lot of issues that need to be solved before we can start selling their products. So the main one is, uh, the very main one that we realized at the beginning is a lack of baseline data. So we didn't know how much they're producing, what are their yield like, uh, what's the space or what's the um, uh, size of the location. Um, And obviously, you know, we try to get those data from uh, Department of Agriculture, but it was non-existential. Uh, And we realized that we have to do it ourselves. So we started doing our own mapping. Uh, We got a drone to do our own mapping ourselves uh, and go on the ground and talk to each farmers and collecting data. So basically, we were just building our own database. Um, And when we finally get all these data, it took us about three years to complete it. Uh, And uh, we realized that this is what we need to do operationally. We can track where where the rice comes from, from which farmers, and this information can actually be added value. Uh, and just this year, earlier this year, we launched uh, a traceability app where uh, we have actually a QR code at the back of our packaging and people can scan and they know where the rice comes from, who's farming it uh, and which area that has been farmed. So that's the first problem and how we overcome that. Uh, the second one is obviously logistics uh, because it's a logging road and four-wheel drive is the only way to go in. Uh, we don't have the luxury to engage uh, JNT Express, for example, or DHL. Uh, so we have to rely on local people and that's where we need the local capacity. Uh, and what we know is local people, they themselves have their own system in the village itself where they have drivers that own a four-wheel drive. They will pick up villages up and down from village to the nearest town. So we leveraged on that and created our own network of drivers. Uh, and that also serves a purpose where we provide job opportunity as well. So they will be responsible in bringing the rice down to the nearest town and then to be shipped it over here to Klang, to Park Klang. Um, the third one is um, lack of supporting industry because we work in such a small town. Lawas town is sandwiched between Sabah and Sarawak. Uh, there's no manufacturing factory that can provide us like, um, you know, carton box, for example. Uh, the nearest town is Miri, which is about 12 hours away, or Sabah KK, which is about four to six hours away. Um, so it was very difficult for us to source products and, uh, you know, plastics or uh, uh, carton boxes. We tried to approach manufacturing, but obviously they have big MOQs, which is about 10,000 MOQ each time we order. And for a micro enterprise like us, first of all, we don't have the money to purchase 10,000 units. And second of all, we don't have the space to store 10,000 units worth of carton boxes. So that was actually a a huge challenge for us and no one willing to work with us if we just want to order 300 boxes. It's like, nah, nah, we don't service that. So that took us a long time to find a partner which is based in Peninsula uh, who are willing to work with us on that. And machineries, uh, obviously at the beginning, we cannot invest so much on the machineries, but most of the industry, they will provide uh, machineries that may be about 20 to 30,000 ringgit worth of machines and which we don't have, we didn't have the capacity at that time. So we had no choice but to turn to technology, which is Taobao. <laughs> Thank goodness for Taobao who were, um, you know, you can actually get everything online uh, and we had to purchase uh, some of our machineries and got them shipped over to Lawas. 
and yeah, that's how we started. And uh, thankfully for that, we're now able to have a better supply chain uh, and continue to grow from there. Thank you. Very, very interesting um, idea on how uh, community impact can be maximized through social enterprises using technology and of course, effective partnership. I think that's something that, that's uh, worthwhile to be um, advocated in, in a stronger fashion. And, and, and I think um, I'm sure with MDEC here, that's something that they could think about. Um, now, you know, as you can see with businesses going and manufacturers going digital, even social enterprises, rural space going digital. My next question is to Meng. So, you know, what are the main risks for businesses, individuals as well? Because, you know, we are highly and deeply connected and getting more and more digital. Um, how can, how can, you know, what are the main risks uh, today that they, the businesses and individuals are failing to mitigate? And, and how can they understand the cyber risks better? and how to mitigate this risk. Thank you, Shariza. Uh, that's what a, a very interesting question because it, it, um, it is one that has uh, become very pervasive. Uh, as Dr. Weira mentioned, there is a rapid shift to digitization. Uh, and as a result, the risk has also increased. Together with the pandemic risk of a, a real virus, we also have an insidious risk of computer-based viruses being propagated by threat actors, as the, as the terminology goes. Um, one, thing which, uh, one thing which has, um, you, you know, you get different answers from different people. You, you ask a consumer, and the first thing that comes to mind will be internet security, antivirus solutions. You talk to an IT professional, and the first thing they will talk about is firewalls and you know, all, all the wonderful technologies. And there's nothing wrong with those technologies, nothing wrong with antiviruses. However, the weakest link in, any, in, in this particular scenario or in this particular computer pandemic is not technology. The biggest risk is actually people. How do viruses uh, or, or threat actors get into computer systems? It is via what we call malware, which is delivered through phishing emails. We have a particular solution called No Before. Uh, I'm not pitching No Before, but just mentioning that with No Before, it is a phishing simulation uh, solution and has been implemented across the world. The first thing we always do is we do a baseline. And with the baseline, on the average, in any organization, 34% of people in the organization will click on a phishing email. When we did that for Malaysia, we found the percentage to be higher, much higher, which means people are not aware that an innocent looking email can be deadly. How innocent? How, how many of us have received Lazada vouchers, uh, KFC vouchers, KFC offers, right? Uh, it's not just the banks, you, know? you, you get uh, McDonald's, you, you get all sorts of offers being coming through your email. And this makes it very attractive. Why not? You know, it sounds like a good deal. It's too good to be true, but it's a good deal. So people will click on those kind of uh, emails. And what they do is they actually release a malware into their system. And you will not, more often than not, you will not see the immediate impact of, of, of such, such, a, such an attack. It usually sits in your system and at a particular time, whether it's by um, a trigger sent in by the threat actor or a time-based trigger, it will trigger and then you will find your data being locked or uh, it has infiltrated your organization's uh, systems and has created more, uh, created a bigger problem than just clicking on the email. So uh, how do we mitigate? Yes, we do need to do the basics, which is internet security. We need to do the basics, which is uh, having uh, antivirus solutions, firewalls, etc. But more than that, uh, as individuals and as uh, leaders in organizations, 
we need also to teach and make our people aware that this is the biggest uh, threat to the organization. People clicking on emails that are seemingly innocent and um, seemingly um, uh, harmless. Um, it is something that uh, we have a passion for because we have seen uh, it, it, organizations implementing this and we've seen the threat levels go from uh, the high 30s down to single digits uh, because as, as the organization turn, turns over, uh, different people will join the organization and they will need to be again trained. Uh, and human beings, are, being human beings, tend to forget. You know? um, even today, when I see a, a KFC voucher or McDonald's, <laughs> it's always so tempting to, to click on those. And it's not only emails. You also get it through SMSs, WhatsApp messages, the, the whole plethora. Um, we do need to educate people. Uh, more importantly, it is educating people not to uh, click on uh, offers which are too good to be true. Thank you so much um, for that, Meng. Um, just to we diversify a bit this discussion, and I like to ask a question to David. And David is a very it's part of a um, company that has been successful in the manufacturing of plastics. And one of the things that we know today about the plastics industry is that you know there's there's been um, uh, debates of how. Uh, negative it, it is, how it impacts the environment and human health with microplastics being in the ocean, getting back into your food uh, ecosystem. Um, I just want, I just want to know uh, what is um, Tong Guan's comment on those accusations and, and basically, you know, moving forward, what is he doing about it? And, you know, whether, whether they think that um, plastics is actually a sustainable industry, David. Yes, it's a, you know, it's a perception in the market that, you know, plastics is uh, polluting the earth. You know, you go on LinkedIn, you go on Facebook, uh, you see a turtle with a straw sticking out of its nose. And, you know, the next day, you know that everyone is changing to a uh, paper straw. Um, what we have done here in, uh, in Tongwan is that uh, we have launched an initiative, which we call Leaf Green. So part of this Leaf Green program, we, uh, we focus on bio-based product. So instead of using fossil oil, uh, polyethylene-based uh, plastics, we use sustainable source plastics, whereby plastics is actually made from wood waste chip. You know? So in the Scandinavia, you know, there's a lot of uh, wood waste. So we work with one of, the, one of our suppliers that they turn these wood waste into plastics. And therefore, you know, by using this material, our plastics, you know, we, we can proudly say that our plastics is sourced from a sustainable source. And one of, the, one of the leaf green program that we run is that we increase the recycle content of the product. So one of our main products is of course, stretch film. So if you have to move a product from destination from A to B, you know, you stretch them. So what we do is that we put a certain level of recycled material into the plastics, whereby, you know, for example, I'll give you an example. In, in the UK, you know, the law will be implemented where if the plastics does not contain X amount of recycled material, there will be duty you know, impose on the plastics being produced. So therefore, recycled material is also a big, a big chunk of our effort to go green. And uh, one of the effort is that we also make compostable plastics, especially garbage bags. So what is compostable plastics? When you put your food waste into a plastics, they goes into landfill garbage. And that plastic stays there for years, you know, maybe 80 years or 100 years. Compostable plastics breaks down by itself and uh, it, will, it will eat up the, uh, the food waste and it will go back to the, the, to the circular system. So 
these are a few things which we have done, you know, to, uh, to help the environment, to change the perception to, uh, towards plastics. And moving on to innovation, what we have done is that, you know, we have created solution for our customers and we see a lot of automated warehouse, you know, people are talking about industry 4.0, you know, a lot of uh, automation on wrapping and all that. So essentially what we have done is that we, each of our firm, we put a QR code on the core, on the paper core. So that provides traceability, like what uh, Lydian had said earlier. You know, if there's any issue with that particular role, the user will be able to trace to that, to that role. And we have a system in terms of uh, hardware and software where let's say if you are a manager of multiple factories, you will be able to monitor the wrapping of your actual product to, to the second or to the minute or to the hour. So you will be, you'll be able to trace the amount of plastic use. You'll be able to trace the performance of your machines, of your wrapping machines. And just by you know, a few clicks, you will be able to know how much your organization spent on plastic in a month, a week, you know, even to the hour. So, you know, Kelvin was saying, you know, unprecedented times or MCO and all that. So without plastics, for example, I would like to give an example. You know, the, the takeaway business, you know, the food takeaway business has increased. You know, what's going to happen to the, uh, you know, to the environment, to the people, to the health and all that, you know, if there's no plastics. So to answer the question, plastic is uh, a very, very much sustainable industry. It is just that, you know, how do we reduce, reuse and recycle the, the plastics, you know, circulating in the economy. So one of the, one of the effort that we do is that we launch a program called Redo. So what we do here is that we work with brand owners, we collect their waste. So if they, if they separate their waste properly, say, you know, PE to PE, PP to PP. So we collect their waste and we turn into recycled material and then we remake into products and, you know, and then we can launch the product into the economy again. So we call this a circular loop or circular economy. So by doing all this effort, you know, we are, we are recycling, regenerating income, regenerating profit for all the stakeholders along the supply chain. So I hope that answered the question. Oh, very interesting, David. Just a just quick follow-up. Do you actually buy the, the um, uh, sorted out PP, uh, PE and PPs from the stakeholders? Uh, we don't buy, but we work with them so that we can reproduce products back to them. It can be, let's say, you know, stretch film can be made into different types of recycled bags. It can be garbage bags. It can be carton liners. Uh, it can be, you know, plastic sheets that cover, you know, protect from water, dust, or any form. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. So we have probably just one more question. And I think I'm going to like... Um, give this question in different sort of its spectrum to our four panelists. This is a question from uh, one of the participants and it is about the retail industry. And today we could see because of the pandemic and also I think looking beyond um, uh, retail, especially if you look at um, hypermarkets or groceries, they're looking at how they could have a low carbon footprint how they could have more automation so that they don't have to have too many um, human components, too many people touching food. Um, and also there's a lot of uh, pressure also for hypermarkets to get products from social enterprises. How, how can social enterprise get and fight for shelf space? And as you go to, towards automation, there's gonna be a lot of issues in terms of security as people are self-servicing, self-paying, um, what are the risks involved? And, 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 and I guess the kind of impact in terms of packaging, 
um, what is the most sustainable are cotton bags sustainable there's, there's a debate you know cotton bags cost a lot more in terms of um, uh, carbon footprint to produce compared to um, uh, plastics and of course that whole system that binds it together so what i'm going to do now just to when uh, after that you know um, describing illustrating that particular um, retail situation um, kelvin um, what do you foresee in terms of uh, the reality to have a self-serving self-paying retail um, uh, industry how far are we from it um, um, and uh, what else that needs to be done Okay. Um, thanks for the question, Sharizal. Yeah, I think um, I think we are closer towards a uh, self-serving retail, right? So obviously, um, I think even before the the current um, situation of the last six months, I think um, there's a lot of practice in terms of a self-serving retail. For example, let's talk about a, a physical retail store. So I think in terms of minimizing, for example, the workforce ability in the market, right? So for example, if you um, there's already some some supermarkets who are, are retail stores out there are already practicing, for example, a self checkout options. You know, if you if you there are certain stores, I have observed that in some other countries, but I think um, they are yet to be available in Malaysia, right? So I think some of the some of the retail store outlets are start to practice that. Yeah, I think if it goes to retails like you know Garden and Watsons, I think you you already observed that. Yeah, but apart from apart from the digitalization of retail, I would say is that um, currently um, there are a couple of models that we observe. So I think the the current digitalization, I think people are much more uh, going towards digital, right? For example, um, even retail stores that we 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 see in the market, we used to go to in the market. For example, the likes of Aeon. Uh, even our local uh, retail store like MyDean and so on, they are already available, uh, especially um, available for, for a consumer to actually purchase their product, book a time slot and get the product delivered to them according to their preferred time window, right? So I think there are two, that's why I mentioned there are two, two parts of it. So obviously self-service, I think uh, we are slowly, slowly getting there, but I think now the focus is much more on digital commerce, right? So for example, you know, um, Digital commerce. Uh, we have spoke. We have spoke to a couple of you know um, big enterprise custom customers out there of SAP. So I think digital commerce is the the current trends as well as the, um, the there's an increase of demands of digital commerce moving forward. So I'm not just talking about uh, digital commerce as a front end portal. I would say uh, because in order to capture, for example, uh, because there's, this this is potentially can be a new business model to some of the key enterprise out there. But in order to be competitive, especially when we talk about digitalization here, it's all about how do you want to capture a market share? Yeah. So for example, if you know we if we are if, I'm not sure if any one of you in the in the panel here is that, you know, have you ever goes into a retail commerce store and you put a product into a cart and suddenly you don't check out and you get a notification of emails to follow up that, you know, hey, you actually left your peanut butter on your cart. You have yet to check out. So it's much more of a commerce will say that we are going towards there. Digitalization is there. It's all about building the end-to-end -end customer journey. Um, that's what's the trend of um, retail, retail, uh, retail industry moving forward. Yeah, apart from that, I think... Uh, the other part I would like to also highlight is that uh, with digitalization, the amount of data out there is tremendous, right? So I think um, if I think people have been talking about, you know, data is the new all, you know, data monetization as a topic, right? Apart from digital digitalization of um, commerce self-service, uh, things are also going towards of a new business model, for example. Certain companies are actually monetizing the data that is not your or my personal data, like address or phone numbers, but it's, for example, the, the purchase trends of certain products and so on. So companies are actually trying to create new business model out there, especially with the digitalization. So for example, they can sell their insight to some of their principal, you know, these are the trends that, you know, a purchasing trend of customer in, let's say, in Slango or Kuala Lumpur or even in, in certain region. Yeah. So that, that's where we are heading towards, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Calvin. I think that's interesting. So yeah. debate between automating and focusing on delivery. Mm. So very quickly, um, Hank, as we go 
more and more into this type of you know, delivery versus automation risks. How does retail, how do retailers then manage these risks? As, as Calvin mentioned, data is a new black oil and um, we, we leave, uh, leave a data trail everywhere we go. Um, retailers love it because they can analyze our habits. Um, and you know, all the different platforms, we have li literally no control over what happens uh, on these platforms. Uh, you buy something from Lazada and your information is there. You go to Shopee and it's there. You go to Tesco, uh, Aeon, you know, any, anywhere you go, you leave a digital trail. Um, it is, and a lot of people say, so what, you know, what, what can they do with, with, um, with my data? Well, they can do a lot of things with their data, unfortunately. Um, this is a, a, a bit of a tough question. Um, one of the... One minute. Just one minute. One minute. Okay. Um, I, I, I do believe that governments have a role to play in this. Uh, and the role to play is to anonymize a lot of this uh, data. That means, yes, they, have, they may have your information and they may want to give you a customer experience, but there must be some kind of legislation that, that will force them to anonymize it so that it cannot be traced back to you uh, in, in the long term. Uh, well, apart from that, the other way that uh, we can look at cybersecurity would be a two-factor authentication. Right now, we love our wave because you know it's you wave and it's paid. Um, I would suggest that it's not a good thing. I think we should have two-factor authentication, which means you either use a pin or some other method of authentication before we can uh, the money can be transferred. Thank you. So interesting advocacy of of open data and GovTech and legislation around it. I think that's uh, one of the interesting sort of topics that we talk about also within the technology community. Now, having said that, as things go digital, debate on uh, getting people uh, to automate uh, purchases versus delivery, how can social enterprises like you that connects people who produces products using digital to create that experience of traceability? How, how, what, what can that look like in say the next couple of years, Lily? Um, I think that's a huge shift in consumer behavior nowadays. A um, few years ago, when we have our own e-commerce, it was difficult to get people to buy rice online because it's almost unheard of, like why would I buy rice online? But because uh, when MCO happened, people were forced to purchase online, and uh, we see that as an opportunity to educate our consumers as well. So we came up with um, ideas like contents to, uh, and produce those contents so that consumers that's purchasing the rice will know where it comes from and how it's been produced. So they will have that kind of experience when they purchase something online, they will be able to see, oh, the, these rice are planted in an area that is full of biodiversity. So there are a lot of education going on as well. So we use that as a platform to not only connect consumers to uh, our farmers, but also educating them why is it important to support these sort of farmers. And that's why the traceability come in as well, where when they have the physical product, they can you know, just scan the QR code and find out about their products. Fantastic. So the future is then we're going to have retailers deep linking with um, product providers and to create the traceability story. And I think that's a useful sort of um, uh, initiative that retailers can then explore with people like um, uh, these farmers through various collectives that we have. Now, last question, David. So we go to delivery, we go to self-service. What about packaging? Are we still looking at plastics? Yes, um, I would like to uh, pose a question you know, to, uh, to all of you. So what happens, you have time, a no very time. good packaging you know, a very, uh, you know, right place, right time. But when, when the goods arrive at the destination, there is damage. So what essentially what we have done in Tongguan is that we set up a Newton lab. Newton is a dynamic simulation lab. So what we do is that uh, we do a lot of uh, testings, um, a lot of uh, simulations, you know, in, uh, in Europe, because we are part of uh, UMOS, European Safe Logistics uh, Association. And in Europe, there's a figure that 
of all transported goods are damaged. And this is in Europe. What about in Asia? So what we do in Newton here is that we have different types of uh, equipment to simulate in the form of uh, e-commerce packaging, in the form of a uh, carton, or even in a bubble pack, up to, let's say, a two-ton pallet, you know, two-ton load pallet. So, you know, we, we simulate that for our customers to minimize their damage, not only in terms of uh, uh, packaging costs, uh, recycle material and all that. We look more into the overall cost, you know, the creating solution for our customers. So thank you very much, David. With that, we end our panel session today. And please give a round of applause to all our panelists. And um, I think in a short summary, the future is still very much uncharted. Um, there's a wide canvas, but clearly the room, the, 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 the order of the day is about collaboration and how to make all these things better for a better world. With that, thank you very much. And over to you, Lynn. Thank you very much, Charizal, and to the fellow panelists who have been providing us with very interesting sharings about how they've been able to pivot their businesses and also to look into the future. I'm sure you'd like to find out which petty field Langit Collective's rise came from, how you can address um, what you call it, cybersecurity. I think now I'm going to be even more careful with what I open on my email. Okay, and then of course, plastics the number one question. I'm sure everybody has that question. But without further ado, I'm gonna go into the breakout session. We have two very formidable moderators, and I'm sure you'd be interesting to know that one of them actually doesn't look like the picture earlier when we were promoting. <laughs> um, Mr. Jesse Chui. He's actually the head portfolio management of Global Growth Acceleration from MDEC. Jesse is also a professional in the ICT industry for the last 25 years. And then, of course, he has all these very interesting conversations that he has in the AI space. And our next speaker, who is Ms. Sheila Singham, she is the second moderator of breakout session number two. She is the co-founder of Human Equation, a former journalist in The Edge. She is an NLP coach. Her accolades amount uh, to that of a mountain. I have nothing else I can say about her, but I can tell you she is definitely someone who can motivate you and inspire you as you have a conversation. Now, as we break into the breakout sessions, one will remain here in the physical room. So we want to encourage those who are here in the room to participate while Sheila actually goes on to the stratosphere of the internet to coach the ones that are online. There's 88 participants. Good luck, Sheila. So the online will definitely be the one to take off and then we head into the breakout sessions.
Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sheila Singham from Human Equation, moderating this session, um, visioning for the future breakout session. And this is the ITAP Innovation Challenge that I'm bringing to you. Uh, let me just share with you. Okay. So, we have a challenge for you today that's very interesting, and I'll come to that in a short while. As you contemplate this challenge, it's sort of a competition that we would like you to participate in. But before that, let me just explain to you that this challenge uh, would depend on some aspects here. So that in terms of the feasibility and attractiveness of the idea that we're putting forward to you. We have got three aspects that we need to be looking at in any idea in innovation. Lots of people say that they innovate, but what is innovate? Innovate is not just creating version two or version three or version four of your version one. Innovate is looking to the future. It's coming up with the hypothesis of what might be needed. And today, there is so much of opportunity out there because of the amazing changes that we've been through. I say amazing because I think it's given us the opportunity to innovate, to pivot, to create, to do things we've not done before. And we actually, it all starts in the mindset as to whether you think this pandemic is, is a problem or an opportunity. So whatever you are going to be creating through that challenge that we're going to put forth, to you and uh, we're going to give show it to you in a short while i believe in a little bit of suspense first is from the aspect of people business and the technical aspect of whatever you're going to be doing because we are talking about technology so let's look at the technical aspect first right the feasibility of whatever you're doing do you have the technology to make it happen now if you don't have the technology can you acquire it or can you partner with someone who has the technology? Is the technology better than the competitors? All right. Uh, whatever it is that you're designing, is it better than the competitors? Are you able to deliver it? Do you have a supply chain? Can you create a supply chain that will enable you to deliver it? Do you believe that there is a better solution than what you're coming up with? If there is a better solution, then migrate morph evolve into that better solution and the next thing is people is it desirable to your market first of all is there a market need lots of people innovate and come up with products where there's no market need if you if you go online you go to youtube you will find uh, youtube videos um products that were created which nobody needed and they were ridiculous but people created them so if you in innovating at this point in time um, it's actually a matter not just of your survival, whether you survive, it's also whether you thrive. Surviving is not enough. If you want to go and be uh, doing business successfully in the new norm, you need to be thriving. So does this hypothetical product or service that you want to come up with address a market need? And what is the total market size? It's got to be sizable for it to be feasible, viable, economically viable. What is the scope of the growth potential? You might start small, but how far can you go with it? And we're talking about how far economically, how far geographically, how far in terms of the innovations from your innovation, right? And the accessibility to your customers, how, again, going back to the supply chain, how accessible is it going to be? Now, today, everything is being, available, uh, is being ordered digitally, is available digitally, yep, order it. How fast is it going to, go from concept to um, design, to manufacturing, to market. And of course, there must be low barriers to adoption. If people like, say if you're coming up with a digital product and people need to be very tech savvy, um, then it reduces your market. So your market is very, very contained. But if you want to open up your market and today uh, our keynote speaker, Dr. Uh, Vera Rice did say that it's about bringing it to the people. So if you want to bring your innovation to the people, uh, there need to be low barriers to adoption. And of course, finally, is the viability of whatever you're designing. Is it a worthwhile opportunity? Worthwhile in what sense? Well, money-wise, 
in terms of social impact, all right, in terms of contribution to society, to the environment, is the profit worth the pivot? So whatever your resources you're going to put into to making it a reality, at the end of the day, um, the cost factor versus uh, the profit, is it viable? Do you have the resources? It's okay if you don't. Now, one thing about innovation that, you sh that should not stop you from innovating, right at the beginning, many people say, uh, but we don't have the expertise, we don't have the financial resources, that's fine. Come up with the idea. Innovation is hypothesizing, coming up with the idea, and then finding the partners. Yeah? And if it's a fantastic enough idea, there will be investors. Think Shark Tank. All right. Finally, of course, is there a big risk? All right. So let's come to the challenge. It's pretty exciting. All of you here at some point or other during the day are using a face mask, right? Some of you have got the medical sort of a face mask that you use. And sometimes you use it for the whole day and you might go to different places and use the same face mask. Some of you prefer, um, like what I have over here, some of you do prefer a cloth mask, yeah? Now, the thing is, what our challenge today is all about revolves around masks. So I'm going to put it up here, okay? What we are going to be asking you to do is to address the issue created by single-use medical masks that are non-recyclable and are being disposed of in landfills and natural waters. I'm sure many of you have seen pictures of turtles which have got face masks wrapped around their faces or fish, uh, you know, which have got face masks after they have been dissected, they have face masks in their stomachs because these are being thrown indiscriminately and also in landfills, uh, they're not biodegradable, so they are impacting our environment. So the negative impact on environment and wildlife. And so you might say, yeah, yeah, I don't use those non-recyclable masks. I have my cloth face masks or something that can be recycled. Yes, but they do still carry the danger of infection. If you use it the whole, whole day, you went to the hospital, you came home, you went out for dinner, you used the same face mask. What's to say there's no infection on that mask? And sometimes even when you put it, uh, when you have several of these face masks, you sometimes might not even remember which one you have cleaned or washed or not. So, you know, all of this can carry the danger of infection. So your mission today in this challenge, should you choose to accept it, is to find a solution to this problem. And you might think there's one solution, there's two solutions. Let me give you some examples of solutions, right? Here are some options you can explore, or you might have something outside of this list that's even more innovative. Bring it on, we wanna know about it. So here are some options. You could create a new eco-friendly mask, something that's biodegradable, or something that has a multiple number of users, you know? Um, and uh, the next thing is you could uh, design a self-cleaning mask. How does it self-clean? Don't know, that's up to your innovation and creativity. You know, sometimes you, you could look at a mobile phone as an example. Some of you have a stand where you can charge your phone uh, at the end of the day. Maybe something where you, you have a mask where you could stand it there and it just sort of self uh, sanitizes, you know? Or perhaps the solution, the, the issue here is non-biodegradable masks being thrown out into the environment. Could we perhaps repurpose these use masks? So there was a, 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 um, that there's been a, a story of uh, tires being repurposed to for garden for landscaping, being repurposed, you know, um, for coral reefs and so on. So maybe there's another use you could find for these use masks, or it could be that you design a new cost-effective process for elimination of use masks, some sort of portable, small, in, uh, ineffective incinerator, which we can take and put in different places like hospitals or shopping centers or, you know, a common area somewhere in a housing estate or condominium or something like that. All right. Okay. Now, just to give you some idea of some tools you could use 
we could use the Scamper tool. Some of you may be familiar with Scamper, but if you're not, it's quite available online. You can go and look at these tools. So one example, one part of Scamper is to substitute, substitute some aspect of the mask to fulfill any of those requirements options to make it maybe less dangerous, biodegradable. Or you could combine, combine two things, a mask, maybe a shield mask with a self-cleansing, um, you know, sanitizing implement. You could add or adapt. This is where maybe you could repurpose the mask, use them for something else. You could magnify, modify, maximize, minimize, do any of those things, um, you know, anyhow you feel, modify the mask so they have another purpose, put to another use. You could eliminate, eliminate the mask altogether, put something else that's there, maybe a shield, you know. And of course, finally, you could reverse or rearrange some aspect. This is just some examples. They're very popular tools, commonly available. Yeah, and these are some of the things that people use when they use design thinking to create new products as well. Some ideas for you. Now, for this challenge, we have certain criteria. What we would like you to do is to give us a brief description of the solution, perhaps just one slide. What is your solution to this issue of non-biodegradable masks that are polluting our environment? If you could give a prototype of a visual, a picture, a photograph, or you could create something physically and take a photo of it, include it into your slide, that would be great. What would be the resources you need to implement? Um, so here, we would like you to look at the material, acquisition of the material, where would you get it from, or would it have to be manufactured? What is the budget? you know, that you would allocate to creating, say, a first generation um, prototype of this. What is the expertise you would require and where would you be able to get that expertise from? Just one slide on the resources. Viability as a business opportunity. So look at where the revenue streams, where, what would be your supply chain, what are revenue streams for this particular um, solution. What is the market size? Is are you going to start? And if you if you look at the market size, are you going to start in your own local market first, as like Malaysia or Singapore, or and then where do you want to expand it to? Or if border um, controls are a problem and you can't export, how would you look at manufacturing this or bringing it to different markets that you are identifying? And also the cost versus profitability. The next thing is to look at the prospect for market expansion. A year-on-year -year plan is an advantage. I do think masks are sort of here to stay for a while until this pandemic is gone, which I uh, don't know when it's going to happen. So, but then you also have to look at the prospect of if it goes away and we have no further need for masks and if we're going to go back to the old norm, what's going to happen to your market? How could you then again look at innovating this for another purpose? Of course, distribution channels under the current world conditions that we are supply chain. Potential partners and investors. Now, this is very important to identify if you don't have the manufacturing capability. But if there is uh, a potential partner who could do the manufacturing, then to, to name them because it would, this would actually help you. And why? I will let you know in a short while. And who are the investors, angel investors or other sorts of investors who might want to come in. Um, this is another criteria, the audience reaction to the solution. So once you have come up with this prototype solution, you have an idea of how it works and you can explain it. Identify some people from different backgrounds. Identify people in the medical industry, retailers um, and manufacturers. Who do you think it is relevant Who's, whoever's reaction is relevant to your solution and just get a few short interviews. Now, these interviews don't have to be via video. If you could, great. Each video is like 20 seconds, you know, 15 to 20 seconds on just their reaction. Or you could just um, get their reaction. You could transcribe it into one or two uh, sentences and put it onto a slide. 
All right, so we are looking at a maximum of 10 slides or so, not more than 12, okay? For you to be able to put all of this to explain your submission. Now, so what we want is a three minute video pitch covering all the criteria. So you could do it in the form of a slide and then, you know, have your voiceover. You could use various uh, forms of technology to do that. Um, or you could have a slideshow with explanation and music. We leave it up to you. And that needs to be emailed to this address, admin at human-equation.com. That's right. You send it to my company. We're going to be looking at it and we're going to be shortlisting the submissions to be showcased at ITAP and the best one selected. So the three best submissions, all right, which fulfill all the criteria uh, and, and sent by noon of 14th October, 2020. You've got two weeks to do that. Um, and rem remember, this is just an idea we are asking you for. We're not asking for a fully developed program. So developing the idea, fulfilling all those criteria and send it to us, the three best shortlisted will be showcased at ITAP and the best one selected. Why is this an advantage to you? Because there will be people watching, there may be potential investors and partners who may say, wow, that's a fantastic idea. I think we want to go into business uh, with these people. So you stand a chance of being matched with one of these potential partners or in investors and uh, being able to have that conversation with them about how to take this new idea to market. And the best one selected, the best idea selected, your organization will be given a masterclass by me to develop the concept, to be able to take that idea and further develop that concept. Or if you choose, we could, I could actually come in and do a masterclass on innovation tools and techniques for your team. So that would be left to you, but there will be a masterclass on your choice of uh, topic related to innovation. Okay, so that is, that is our innovation challenge. Um, I would like to open up to questions. If you have any questions about this, if you want further details, please feel free to put your hand up, right? And let me know so that I can unmute you. And you can ask me the question or you can type it in the um, chat group or best to ask me the question. Okay, you can type it in the chat group as well. Do participate. Um, because it's a, it's a great challenge. It's a, it's a very relevant current challenge uh, that is very, very relevant to our current times. I personally, myself, um, am trying to avoid using these uh, medical masks um, out of um, sort of care for the environment. But then again, it brings home the point of sometimes I carry out my mask and, you know, I'm just wearing it the whole day and that's not very safe as well. If you do have questions, please do um, ask or put it into the chat group. We'd be more than happy to clarify, but uh, please be mindful that the closing date is 14th October and you'll get to showcase um, whatever you've come up with your idea uh, in the ITAP. Okay, I would gather that uh, everyone is um, sort of, it's been quite clear, but if there's anything else that you would like to clarify, you would like to ask, please do communicate with me. So this, can, this challenge, you can, you can sort of submit for it on a personal level. 
as an individual who has attended this um, session, or you can take it back and put the challenge to your organization and you can submit it at an organizational level. If you feel that there is, this is an idea that can, you, you, your organization can monetize and take to market, then please do um, submit as an organization because you would have the additional resource of many more minds combined to, to make for a really, really creative, innovative solution. Okay, so uh, back to the control. Um, if there is anything else that any of you need to ask? Great. So I am going to go back and share the criteria, the challenge again, for some of you who are, um, the challenge is to find a solution to the issue of single use medical masks that are non-recyclable and having a negative impact on the environment, which of course can be monetized and taken to market. The options would be to, so that's a challenge, options, would be examples, these are some examples, but you are not bound by these options. You can always innovate outside of this and come up with something even more amazing. Um, and then I'm not gonna go into the scamper tools, but just focus on the criteria. We would like to see a minimum of 10 slides presented as a video, uh, very exciting, very compelling, uh, that would, um, cover all of these areas to present your idea with the intention of being shortlisted and showcased at ITAP and the best one selected. Okay, so thank you very much for being here. Um, I hope it's given you an interesting challenge and some motivation to apply. Very often we, we come for a session like this and we listen to some great ideas and then we say, okay, good. And then we go back and we get sucked up in the milieu of, of work and we say, mm, okay, we don't have time to focus on that. But we're giving you this amazing opportunity with some um, ideas, some criteria, and we hope that you make it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sheila, and thank you, Jesse, for having uh, chaired the breakout sessions earlier. We now come back to the main room over here. And now I present to you, of course, Mr. C.Y. Fong, Mesa Worldwide and Duran uh CEO, for the closing remarks. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for being here. These are very, very challenging times uh, because of the uh, recent increase in numbers the number of people who sign up to come today also uh, was reduced quite considerably. But we are so happy to see that there are so many people online. Yeah, uh, We'd like to thank the chairman of MDEC, especially, for a very interesting and open uh, opinion about what we can do with new businesses and why we must move forward. Uh, so, uh, and the rest of the panel who also gave their insights why things need to change and why we need to be a little bit more forward looking. I think what is most important is we are all thinking about what the economy is going to uh, be like. We should think about what we can do and contribute to building the economy especially after this uh, episode of uh, pandemic. Uh, so we'd like to thank all the speakers uh, and all the panel uh, people for telling us what we need to do and uh, what the future is going to look like. Yeah, uh, a lot more digital activities will have to happen. Even some of our exhibitions have already gone uh, digital. Yeah, so, uh, so that is very important for all of us. And I wish everybody well that uh, we shall see a renewed Malaysia yeah, and a more resilient Malaysian businessman 
uh, who will come out flying instead of coming out crying. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is, uh, we'd like to thank uh, ITAP2 uh, for, for hosting this event because ITAP is for Industrial Transformation uh, 4.0. Always remember, 4.0 is a target. Yeah, it is the ultimate target. Many countries and many industries in many countries are not yet 4.0 ready. Yeah, even the most uh, developed countries, some of them are also in the zone of 3, 3.5. So Malaysia, we have plenty to catch up, but we can do it, I'm sure. With entrepreneurs like, uh, uh, like we have here today, yeah, from, uh, from agriculture to, to, to technical, uh, services, I think we can, we can really, really catch up. But what we need to know is what is out there. If we don't go out and see, we will not know what is out there. So we would like to welcome everybody when ITEP is again available next year to come there. But the nearest would be if Hanover Fair takes place in April, we would like to welcome everybody there. Look at what Hanover Fair has to offer on technology and also uh, AI and uh, machinery. Yeah, I think we, we, we have come a long way. We know what has happened to our industry. Uh, so many people are complaining, oh, I have no more foreign labor, so I cannot manufacture enough. Even the biggest companies who are manufacturing uh, medical products also find it difficult to have enough uh, labor. So automation probably and AI will be the way to go. Thank you very much, everybody. Let's uh, meet again soon uh, when the uh, uh, situation becomes better. Good day.